Okay. <clears throat> Father, as we come before you this evening, it is uh, with hearts that are very willing to acknowledge that there was nowhere else for us to go except to you, to your presence, before your face, and acknowledge you as the true and the living God, our God and Saviour, <clears throat> the one who has promised before time to save us in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and so we come tonight as saved people, as forgiven people, as people who have been made righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ, as people who can come freely to the throne of grace, as people who have been filled with the Spirit of Christ and and can take the graces of Christ and the love of Christ and the mercies of Christ into the lives of others. And, and Father, we're here because we want you to use us in the lives of others. We want you to use us in that pastoral counselling sense of being able to step into the lives of troubled Christians and bring the hope of gospel grace in ways that understand them, in ways that encourage them and draw them closer to the Saviour, to that throne of grace. Father, as we uh, <clears throat> begin dealing tonight with uh, the subject of adolescence, it is, um, we're very aware that in our churches there are adolescents and there are young people uh, <clears throat> who will be moving into that stage of adolescence. And, and we ourselves look back on our own adolescence and we know, Father, that it's a time of change and a transition which is often accompanied by crisis. And we ask, Lord, as, if, if we, as we have, have another look at that stage in the life cycle that you would teach us some things about how to encourage the adolescents who share our lives. So we commit our time to you tonight and we commit those adolescents to you tonight and we pray for Hans tonight and ask that you would heal his body and comfort him and encourage him in the things of Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. Hello. So, adolescence, between two worlds. Once again, this book is uh, a recommended source for uh, parenting teens or adolescents. Now, because we missed a class a few weeks back, we're going to do, do, do two classes tonight. We're going to do our first lecture on adolescence now, our second lecture after the break, and next week our third lecture on adolescence, spending three, uh, three classes on adolescence. The adolescent is being called by life to grow up. It's a call that cannot be avoided or postponed. The adolescent has made it through conception and infancy, has made it through early childhood, has made it through middle childhood, and uh, they're on the move. They are moving, and those clocks that we talked about, they're moving at a breakneck speed, and adolescence is upon them. It can't be postponed, it can't be avoided, and adolescence is going to be their... Uh, growing up period and preparing for adulthood. All that has gone on in the life of the child before adolescence now comes into stark relief. Any of those tasks that were supposed to be successfully committed uh, are completed back here, if they're not successfully completed, will show up in adolescence. The time of adolescence is getting longer. As puberty, the defining moment of adolescence, occurs earlier and marriage occurs later. Um, so in uh, modern society, what was uh, used to be considered as adolescence over the teenage years has now been extended. It now starts before the teenage years and it goes beyond the teenage years. So now rather than talking about teenage, we talk about adolescence. And uh, <coughs> these in-between years often associated with the teenager are being extended. This was not the case in the period in which the Bible was written. Uh, then there was virtually no adolescent period. Young people were married at a much earlier age and 
went into the workforce much earlier and died much earlier. Um, is adolescence then a creation of modern life? Do we believe in adolescence? Uh, I have... Uh, we're not going to look at this tonight, but this is a, a very good article written by uh, a lady called Marty Keyes, who invented adolescence. And she, uh, <coughs> she grapples with that question of, is there a period of adolescence? And uh, how come it's come about? How has our society contributed to the, to the adolescent situation? And uh, how can we deal with it biblically? Hence the stages of adolescence have been divided up into early, middle and late adolescence. Now, as you look at those, uh, as you look at that age range there from 10 to 25, you realise that in fact, um, for some people, particularly girls, puberty can begin at 10, 11, and uh, you go right up to 25 and people are still single, they haven't moved into uh, uh, the tasks of early adulthood while adulthood is coming upon the biological clock ensures they move into adulthood, but they haven't yet accepted the tasks of early adulthood, which is to, uh, to find a spouse and to accept the responsibilities of marriage and children uh, in order to ensure that the human race continues. And so there's this long period of time now, say between 10 to 25, and as you look at that, you realise that you can't treat them all the same during that age period, that uh, children at intermediate and uh, the first years of high school, for instance, are very different from those who have left high school. And you notice the late adolescent, 17 to 25, was basically the school leaver, the one who was in tertiary or university or apprenticeship or training for vocation in some way. Hence, for instance, uh, as if we think about working with youth in our churches, we realise that we can't put the 10 to 25-year-olds all into one group and minister to them as uh, the youth in our church. And so we, we make efforts at dividing them up somewhat along these lines and we, we might have a, a, a youth identity for high schoolers and a separate youth identity, say young adults, for those that have left high school, the tertiary group. Um, and the idea has been that when they, when they get married they kind of graduate out of that youth group into young marrieds. You see, it's, a, it's an effort of of even in our church culture to try to grapple with this, this change that's taking place during those, those years of growing up between childhood and adulthood. Uh, you'll know that if you've, um, uh, if you've uh, parented adolescents, you'll know that, that uh, children who are just beginning high school, for instance, around 13, and... Um, Children who, be, who are beginning, say, university, around about the age of 18 or 19, so you have both of them in your family, you'll realise that there's... Uh, the similarity is that both of them are transitioning from one, one educational institution to another, and yet they're both handling it very differently. The 13-year-old compared to the 18-year-old will be handling it quite differently. And, and, and so as a parent, you see, the challenge is to be able to make those shifts in your own thinking as your children move through the early, middle and late years of adolescence. Well, here's some more uh, just background information for you on adolescence. It has been estimated that 250 million children in the world under the age of 14 are working. Under the age of 14 are working. In the Western world, however, children of this age are generally in school as child labour laws and compulsory education keep children and adolescents in school and out of the workforce. Uh, this is a more sentimental view of children than, say, the economic view. So uh, those who regard children as an economic unit of the family will see sending them out to work as more important than getting an education. Um, now, in, in New Zealand, you know, uh, compulsory education means that, that uh, if, you, uh, if you're an immigrant family, for instance, who, who comes from a country where there's not compulsory education and children are expected to be in the workforce, uh, you, you come to a country like New Zealand and, in fact, the children have to be in school. Uh, 
But what you often see is uh, the children are still considered to be an economic unit and part of the economic unit makes up the family. And so uh, the uh, immigrants will buy businesses and the whole family will be expected to work there and the child is expected to work in the, in the dairy or in the fish and chip shop or whatever it is. Uh, after school, in the weekends, school holidays, there's no, there's no thought that the child is having time off from schooling. Rather, the idea of the child as an economic unit is still very much in force. Uh, <coughs> you can also see this too in families which, uh, in New Zealand, who perhaps don't value education highly. And as soon as a child is uh, 16 and is able to leave school legally, uh, the parent will often encourage the child perhaps to move into the work workforce rather than move into tertiary education. You see, again, they're viewing the child as an economic unit um, rather than as uh, one who continues, who, whose training must continue on to prepare them for adulthood. So these different views of children and different views of young people and adolescents uh, can be seen even in the families that we work with. Uh, if we have a, uh, if we, uh, if you're in a church, for instance, that's in a, um, um, a middle class area, a middle upper class area, uh, education, tertiary education is going to be more highly valued, and uh, so there'll be a lot of encouragement for children to move on into tertiary education. If you have a church, perhaps in a low socioeconomic area where education is not encouraged or valued, you'll find that children uh, not only are not encouraged in their education, but when, as soon as they get to adolescence and there's a large, a large uh, turnency problem, for instance, and they're, they're, they're out of school when they shouldn't be, there's not a lot of pressure from the family to keep them in school, and as soon as they reach 15, they're out. And You, you see, and it's, it's a different view of children. It's a different view of adolescence. And, and how should we view them? Should we view them as, as uh, at 17 or at 15 as people who are ready to work and be adults, in other words, we push them into here, or do we see them as, no, we have to keep them here and, and help them to prepare, say, tertiary in order to prepare them for adulthood? And, and how we answer that question is so much dependent upon what our society and our culture are saying to us about children. And if our culture, like New Zealand, puts a high value on material possessions, a high value on personal wealth, we're going to perhaps want our children to remain in a stage of training and uh, accumulating degrees in order to ensure that when they get into adulthood, marriage and family, they have children. And so a young person might get married, say uh, Christian young people tend to get married earlier than non-Christian young people, and so Christian young people get married, say in their late teens, early 20s, but they'll put off having children. You see, they'll put off having children in order to either finish their education or to save money to buy a house so they can both work because when they have a child, you know, they're back to one income. You see how the economic view is coming in and ensuring that the adolescent period continues, even though they're married, they're still operating as if they were in an adolescent training preparation period for adulthood. Now, as we think about that, not only as parents, but as pastoral counsellors, and we perhaps uh, involved in counselling adolescents, or perhaps involved in, in a family-based counselling situation which includes adolescents, we're going to find that the attitude of the family to the adolescent and the attitude of the adolescent to the family is going to be absolutely critical for helping that family to function biblically. And so we're going to have to, you see, we're going to have to decide for ourselves uh, and, and the church cultures that we're in, what, what value do we place on the adolescent period? Is it something, is it a kind of an annoying period that we should get over with as quick as possible? Is it something which we uh, kind of live in some state of denial? Say, well, the adolescent period should be a period of calm. These children have been brought up in a Christian environment. They should move into adolescence with a strong faith in God and there shouldn't be any problem or hassles and they'll find a Christian partner move into adulthood trouble-free, stress-free and no angst appearance. See, or do we see adolescence as a time of radical change and growth and preparation for adulthood? And if we do, then as parents or as pastoral counsellors or as leaders in our churches, we're going to have to make room and space for that in our own hearts for the adolescent. Adolescents are faced with a bewildering range of changes and choices. The world is no longer safe, nor their bodies predictable. 
from the time that they mastered potty training right through to adolescent, their body was causing them no problems. They, they barely thought about it. They barely thought about even the kind of clothes they were wearing. See? Yeah, there's that a whole period there of predictability and safety and provision. Uh, very little choice, very little change. Felt very safe. And then comes adolescence, a life transition that plunges many of them and their families into crisis. Um, adolescence is a time of transition, no question about that, but is it a time of crisis? Well, because it's such a sig significant transition, we should expect uh, a greater likelihood of crisis. But not every adolescent who goes through the transition goes through a crisis, depending on many factors. Uh, certainly the home environment would be a major factor and the attitude of parents would be a major factor, whether or not they go through a, a, a crisis associated with adolescence. But given the, for instance, given the way our society treats the adolescent, treats them as a consumer, treats them as an economic unit, treats them as a, as a, uh, as a mature sexualized adult, and bombards the adolescent not only with sexual opportunities, but bombards the adolescent with material and purchasing opportunities. What, and, and, and over here is the, is the parent who is trying perhaps to, to, to shield the adolescent from some of those pressures from society, like they did back here. We're setting ourselves up for crisis. Perhaps it's an unavoidable crisis. Perhaps it's a crisis where parents and adolescents have the opportunity to walk through this crisis together and learn things about each other and about each other's own hearts and how to trust God in times of crisis. You see, once the, once the child leaves home, once the adolescent leaves home and moves into adulthood, whatever transitions and crises they face down here, they will handle it in the way they've been taught to in the home. Now, in the home, apart from potty training, there's been no crisis until they get to adolescent. There in adolescence is the opportunity for parent and child together to learn before God how to, how to deal with a crisis that comes from a major transition. So that as that child is launched into adulthood, from adolescence into adulthood, they're taking those lessons with them of how to, how to deal with, with crisis that comes through major transition because neither the adolescent nor the parent knows what kind of transition is up ahead for them uh, we know there's early adult or middle and old, old age, old age. We know there's those transitions, the biological clock transitions, but we don't know what other transitions are up ahead in terms of uh, relationships, in terms of unexpected death and accident, in terms of the uh, crises of childbearing and child raising. So here's an opportunity to learn some things about how to deal with life crisis. Now often the opportunity is missed because the parent and the adolescent are at loggerheads, the parent are ex is expecting a true a smooth transition, and often the adolescent is expecting a, true, a smooth transition, and when suddenly the transition becomes disruptive and crisis laden, neither the parent nor the adolescent was expecting that, and they both react to it in different ways, and so they miss the opportunity to learn how to shepherd each other's hearts through crisis and transition. The adolescent is moving away from the family <coughs> toward peers for their understanding about life and for the meeting of their social needs. Uh, why do you think that would be? Why would the adolescent begin looking outside of the family for their understanding about life and the meeting of their social needs? I'm suggesting they do it anyway. Because they know well, they don't always stay with their parents, so I guess it's sort of knowing, I know whether it's unconscious or conscious, but they're not always going to be with their parents, so you, you'll have to learn to get by without them. Remember all those clocks we talked about, the biological clock? 
and the social clock, and uh, the, um, there was another one. All those different clocks are going through transition. Now, what's happening with the child in terms of its social clock and looking to others outside of the family for their social need, the child is, uh, its social clock is pushing them, is pushing them, as Andrew said, is pushing them away from the family into adult life, where in adult life they won't be looking back to their family of origin necessarily for all their social needs. They, won't, they don't want to lose contact with the family of origin, but at the same time the family of origin is no longer the, the only context in which their social needs are going to be met. So they're, uh, they're going to end up moving into adulthood and having friends and having ministry and having opportunities among adults whom their parents do not know and have probably have little in common with and with the parents who do not have a large part to play in. Now, another reason why it's absolutely essential that the adolescent begins to look beyond the family of origin for their social needs is in order to find a spouse. Otherwise they'll end up marrying their first cousin, you see, if they don't move out of the family of origin. So here's the adolescent, you know, start hanging around with a crowd that the parents don't know too much about. Whereas remember back here, back here the parents made all those decisions about the child's social needs, whose kid's birthday party they'll go to, and the parent is there hovering over them, you see, and just, and, and but now, now the adolescent wants to have their own friends irrespective of mum and dad. It plunges mum and dad into crisis, right? The adolescent is great with it. They're fine with it. It has to happen. Otherwise, the child will be socially dependent on their parents right on through. So they'll begin um, uh, looking toward their peers for understanding about life. Well, unless there are a twin or a triplet. Who else in the family is going through the adolescence experience that they're going through? Even if they're, say, 18 and they have a, a 14 or 16-year-old sibling, you see, it's still different for the 15-year-old from the 18-year-old. So the 18-year-old and the 15-year-old are feeling very what? Very alone in the family. Because no one else in the family is experiencing what they're experiencing. It's a very alone experience. And the doubts or the confusions or the questions or the anger or the, or the angst that they're going through is very much theirs. It's not shared by the family of origin. So they're going to gravitate towards other 15-year-olds going through the same experiences. Other 18-year-olds going through the same experience. And they're going to, in talking to their fellow 18-year-olds or fellow 15-year-olds, they're going to begin to get a little bit of balance, a little bit of perspective, and oh, uh, you're having trouble with your parents too, just like I am, or maybe that's normal. And, and, and see, if, if, if we're still homeschooling here, if we're still homeschooling here, uh, is that going to give the adolescent the opportunity that they need to begin to uh, move out and find that understanding? Now, um, Eden had 10 siblings, and they were all homeschooled, right through the end of high school. Um, and we were talking just before the class started, and there was very little adolescent angst in her family. So there in, uh, well, with all those many siblings, they really were creating their own world of social interaction, you see. And, their own world of adolescent transition. So we don't want to catastrophize this period beyond what we need to, because uh, you know it, it can be a very smooth transition for a lot of families. This transitional move to independence takes them away from the controlling influence of home and parents. Uh, you see, if you Another way to look at this is to see uh, this here as a state of uh, uh, dependence and this here as independence from the family of origin. And adolescence is the transition where you cross over from one to the other, from being dependent on family of origin to being independent of family of origin. 
not isolated from, not separated from family of origin, but independent of family of origin. So over here, you see, you're making decisions without reference to mum and dad. Now, depending on the relationship, you might be comfortable talking to mum and dad about your decisions, or you may not, depending on how mum and dad are with your independent decision making. But either way, you will be in a state of independence, and you got there because through adolescence you made that switch. Uh, <coughs> Notice I said there it takes them away from the controlling influence of home and parent. It doesn't take them necessarily away from home and parents, but rather from the controlling influence. Um, you can imagine in the time of uh, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, where uh, Abraham had his tent, and Isaac uh, grew up in Abraham's tent when he got married to Rebecca. They had a little tent next, next door to Abraham's tent, you see, and then and there'd be another little tent, you see, and, and they were separated without being separated. He was independent without being removed. Um, well, it's, well, it's like that today, really. We, we, uh, we tend to uh, move away without wanting to sever. The, where the chain that links us to our children uh, during adolescence becomes that elastic band which now stretches as the child goes out and finds that independence but the child doesn't want the connection to break or to sever. And in early adulthood there is often a returning back to the family home as adults now rather uh, as adults now rather than as children especially when they become parents themselves. So what happens here is uh, uh, through here, particularly when the children arrive, there's a return back to the family of origin. So what I often say to parents who've got children around this age here is just, just wait, they'll come back. It's always too soon to panic. They'll come back. Wait till they have a, their first baby or two. And uh, <coughs> um, you have to wait till they're 25. Wait till they're at least 25 before you have any major expectations about adult, mature adult living. Now, of course, that's just, it's not a totally arbitrary figure, but it's not a figure that's set in concrete for everybody. Uh, but sometimes that can be quite helpful to realize that, in fact, at, at 16 and 17, they're not going to be mature adults as much as we would like them to be. I remember saying to one father, who had a 17-year-old, I said, oh, well, you've got to wait till he's 25, and he goes, that long? I have to put up with him until he's 25. Well, <clears throat> thankfully, the relationship's a whole lot better. As the father got a little bit more perspective on things, he eased back on his expectations and demands, and what do you know, the relationship improved. Um, uh, my own daughter, who's married, announced to me, announced to Margaret and I the other day that um, when she is, has her first baby, she wants to come and live with us for three months, she and her husband, so that uh, mum can help her with the new baby. <laughs> you see, they do come back. <laughs> They're boomerang children. They do come back. Now, <clears throat> you see, again, that's why the relationship between parent and adolescent, which comes under a lot of strain during the adolescent period, the relationship is so important. Uh, to keep that relationship intact. Uh, you don't want the adolescent leaving home and, and launching into early adulthood, uh, uh, burning their bridges, shaking the dust off their feet without a backward glance and, and, and uh, vowing never to come back again to home. See, you don't want that. A as a parent, you don't want to so aggravate the adolescent that they leave under that kind of a situation because it will change. As they move into adulthood, suddenly their family of origin will become more important to them, but in an independent kind of way rather than a dependent kind of way, and they'll want to come back. They'll want to know the door is open to come back. And so, you see, the, the parent has to manage the relationship during adolescence, taking that long-term view, taking that long-term view, say, beyond the age of 25, uh, and reassuring themselves that uh, when our child, our adolescent child, is into adulthood, we'll be able to uh, welcome them back with joy when they're ready to come back.
over the page. As the adolescent moves away from childhood, what rites of passage does our culture hold out to them by which they can gauge their progress in growing up? The drinking, driving, voting age is within their grasp. Is this adulthood? The opportunity for their first sexual encounter and drug taking is within their grasp. Is this adulthood? Redefining their faith commitment. Is this adulthood? Who will tell them? Where will they go to find out? What voices will they heed? The adolescent is very aware of the fact there's a lot more voices out there than just the family. Back here in childhood, the only voice they're hearing is the voice of the family and perhaps the voice of the church. When they get into adolescence, particularly if they move into tertiary education or out into the working world and apprenticeship, they're going to suddenly be aware there's a lot more voices out there than we ever believed possible. All speaking into my life, all speaking into my issues, all speaking into my belief systems. It's, it's bewildering. And, uh, and the adolescent may well go through a faith crisis as they go to university, or as they go into the workforce, and they're suddenly surrounded by people who not only don't believe, but have, appear to have very good reasons for not believing, very articulate reasons, reasons that, that make their belief seem ridiculous and childish and immature, beliefs that belong to childhood. And so do those beliefs have to be shaken off in order to make it through into adulthood? So the, uh, the male adolescent, the male adolescent, as they are faced with the inevitability of adult adulthood, of manhood, something they cannot escape, the male adolescent spends their adolescent years asking themselves the question, do I have what it takes to be a man in an unsafe world? And if they don't receive an affirmative answer during adolescence, they're going to go into adulthood looking to others to answer that question for them. Probably their wife, perhaps their boss, perhaps ultimately their children, an answer to that question. Do I have what it takes to be a man in an unsafe world? And uh, in adolescence, they'll look primarily to their father for the answer to that question. And if the father doesn't provide the answer to that question, uh, for whatever reason, either he's absent physically or he's absent emotionally, if he doesn't provide the answer to that question, then the adolescent male goes into early adulthood unprepared to face adulthood with the affirmation that, yes, I do have what it takes to be a man in an unsafe world, to be a man for God, uh, to be a man who can uh, take a wife, start a family, provide guidance, strength, leadership, comfort, security, grace, and, and uh, pass on a blessing to my family, all the tasks of godly manhood, you see? And, and in adolescence, they're, they're learning and trying to understand whether or not they've got what it takes to do that. Now, if they go into adulthood, Without that lesson being learnt, then uh, they're going to uh, choose a spouse, on, uh, choose a wife on the basis of, will this woman help me feel like a man? Will this woman make me a man? Will my relationship with her make me feel like a grown-up? And so they move into marriage, and, and that's, that's his pull, that's his requirement from her and eventually she gets sick of it and she tells them to grow up, stop being a baby and, uh, or whatever and then boom, you're, they come to you for marriage counselling. You see, and now as he faces the crisis that comes with a transition that should have taken place here, an incompleted task in adolescence surfaces in the marriage relationship. Now the task is to help him within his marriage relationship and with his, within his adult relationships to learn what it means to be a man, what it means to step up and take bold and courageous leadership for Christ. Uh, the adolescent girl, what's the question that keeps her awake at night? Well, I'm not strictly qualified to answer that. So would you girls like to stab at an answer to that? What, what's the... What's the question the adolescent girl is asking herself as she faces approaching adulthood? Don't feel any pressure. 
you don't answer, that's fine. See, remember that the great task of early adulthood is to find a spouse. The great task of early adulthood is to find a spouse. So, here in adolescence, particularly towards the upper end of adolescence, the great question is, am I going to be able to pull that off? Am I going to be able to manage that task which the clocks of my life are forcing upon me, that a task that is unavoidable? And so you'll ask questions around that. And, you know, perhaps the girl will be asking questions of, um, uh, do I have what it takes to attract a man who will take care of me and love me well? It, sound, it feels very risky. It feels, it feels terrifying, stepping out into that unknown, away from the comfort of family. And, and uh, you know, you know that you can't stay at home. You know that. Instinctively, you know that. You feel these unseen forces pushing you in the small of your back, pushing you out of the family of origin as the adolescent years get higher and higher. And, and, uh, and as you look out into that world out there, that unsafe world, you're asking yourself, where is he? Do I have what it takes to attract him? Will he find me? Now that can often produce a crisis. And um, it may well be that in the, uh, in the counselling environment that you will find yourself uh, counselling with perhaps women struggling with singleness or women who find themselves in marriage only to find that in fact maybe they jumped too soon, maybe they should have waited a bit longer, maybe they shouldn't have just married the first guy that asked them. You see all those questions because remember the great question of adolescence, they're looking to have it answered here and now they're in marriage, they're wondering whether in fact um, uh, this is the guy that, that I should have married. Should I have trusted God and waited a bit longer? See and at and, and, and the same time the guy's saying to himself, well I don't feel much like a man around this woman, she just treats me like my mother did, like a little boy and, and, and this isn't going to, this is no good for me and so you see there's they have their own crisis. Next term we're going to be spending lots of time on marriage. The great crisis of adulthood. <laughs> Surveys in America among the white middle class shows 55% of teenagers have trouble free passage through adolescence. There we go, 55. That's quite high. 30% have some trouble, while for 15, it is the beginning of a downward spiral into life of crime and welfare dependency. In a culture like South Auckland, we may expect these figures to be different, simply because South Auckland is not white middle class. Within the South Auckland culture, you have these little cultural anomalies called churches. See, and within the South Auckland culture, we have these churches, and you know, we know the Polynesian culture is quite a churched culture, uh, but also within um, other, uh, uh, with white ethnic identities in South Auckland, there is church culture and uh, church cultures that uh, we're involved in. I mean, there's three South Auckland churches represented here tonight. Um, and we find that uh, with our own teenagers, uh, we are seeking to raise them in a way that represents perhaps more of those uh, figures there for white middle class. Uh, but we're very aware of the fact that out there in South Auckland, it's not like that for many families. Um, and so if you're going to be a church that is outward looking, that is seeking to connect with the culture outside of your church culture, say a South Auckland culture, you're going to, be, you're going to find yourself um, involved with young people who seem in some ways very immature for their age and in other ways very mature for their age. In other words, because of their family situation, they haven't completed the tasks, and so they've come into adult, adult uh, adolescent 
unprepared for adulthood, unprepared for the crisis of adolescence, and have, have got no, um, no categories, no uh, family context, good family context in which to learn the lessons of adolescence. And so in our outreach ministries, our churches are now going to have to provide that for them. And, and you see, not only do we have to understand adolescence, we have to understand adolescence as it applies to young people who have not had good experiences back here and are really struggling. And we look at them and we fear for their life as adults. In 1991, the World Health Organization determined that New Zealand had the highest rate of male youth suicide among the 23 OECD countries. Uh, now, in the, in the online Herald this week, uh, we learnt there had been a 32% increase in youth suicide in New Zealand in the last 12 months. So that 1991 figure is still in play. In 1992, we had the third highest rate for female youth suicide. Uh, United Nations Children's Fund report in June 1994 targeted this country as having the highest rate of teenage suicide in the industrialised world. It's hard to believe, isn't it? A country as blessed as New Zealand. Um, uh, in the Courier last week, we were told that in the last 12 months, $90 million dollars were spent in South Auckland on pokey machines. Now, I don't know if that was a typo in the Courier. When I saw that, I said to myself, that can't be right. 90 million in 12 months spent on pokey machines in South Auckland. Then you add to that the money spent on drugs and alcohol, and you begin to see why so many of our South Auckland adolescents get into adolescence from a childhood where they have suffered multiple deprivations because of a home in which the resources of the home are not directed towards the children but are directed elsewhere. And so 90 million is spent on pokies and children come to school hungry. You see, it, it's, it, you see what we're doing? It's a ticking time bomb, isn't it? And so we've got all these angry adolescents launching into adulthood without a clue how to live, how to do relationships, how to care for people, how to love people, and how to raise their own children. It's an exciting time to be a Christian in New Zealand. As the politicians rush to redefine marriage, but hold back on the opportunity to limit teenage drinking. See, and within about three days of each other in the same week. You see, it's, it's a society that's determined to remove all constraints on adolescent behavior. No constraints on sexual behaviour, no constraints on, on alcohol behaviour, no constraints on uh, how they socialise, no constraints on how they spend their money. And they get launched into adulthood without any constraints. <clears throat> the media in our Western society is committed to promoting consumerism as a way of life. They seek to keep youth from growing up into adulthood so as to keep them free and impulsive with their discretionary spending. Now, just think about that. See here, these, say these 17 to 25 year olds, that's the target for the media. Perhaps the 14 to 16 year olds as well, but the 17 to 25 year olds, they're the ones who are footloose and fancy free. I ought to be single and let my money jingle. That's the 17 to 25 year olds, you see? They've got, they've got no adult commitments or responsibilities relationally or financially or otherwise, and yet they've got money, they're earning, and it's in the media's interest, it's in society's interest to keep them in this state for as long as possible so they can milk as much of their resources from them as they can. And so what will they encourage them to do? They will encourage them, rather than settling down into monogamous relationship, Express yourself freely by all means and have many relationships. In other words, remain in this state for as long as you can, up until your 30s even, just so long as we have access to your pocketbook. If we can keep you from buying into mortgages, buying into having to pay for children's education, then we can keep your expenses flowing in our direction. You see, so the whole of our youth culture is designed to prevent them growing up into adulthood. Then we'll lose 
connection with them, contact with them as a consumer. Youth look to the media for their guidance as to what kind of society they have to grow up into and survive in. The media look to the youth for their own survival. So uh, where do our young people, our adolescents, where do they learn about this world they're about to be launched into as adolescents? Well, they look for those, those voices in our society that are holding up to them uh, the society that... Uh, that, that they're about to be a part of. And so uh, they look, for instance, Christian adolescents would look out and see a society which is um, sexually permissive, a society which, which they've, they've been taught that they're not free to do with their bodies as they please. How are they going to live in a society that's sexually permissive? How are they going to live in a society where there's such a huge emphasis on consumerism and materialism? How are they going to live in that kind of society? A very different society from perhaps the one they were raised in. This is part of the crisis and transition of adolescence. Um, adolescents have no story of their own that they can claim and stand on. See, at this stage of their lives, they've got no life experience to help them answer the questions of adolescence and to prepare them for adulthood. Now down here, you see, middle eight, adulthood, late adulthood, they've got some life experience now to help them as they move into old age and they're making decisions, you know, that will prepare them and set them up for the transition from old age into old, old age, you see there. But back here, they don't have any of that. All their life story belongs to their parents. And, and do they have a faith of their own? Do they have a, a view of life which is their own, a view of their society and their culture which is their own? Have they answered those questions as, as, as young men and young women? Well, they don't have a story. They don't have that life experience. And so they're like, um, they're like little sparrows hopping around on the ground. And, and behind the corner, there's a cat watching them. And the cat's ready to spring. See, the sparrow is the adolescence. And the cat is, is life in an unfallen world. The Mack truck of life is about to run them over and they don't even see it coming. And they have no life experience in which to prepare for it, to get out of the way of that truck. None of us can. The Mack truck of life has got all our names on it, you see? And, and, and it's the adolescent who's been prepared in his home and his environment as an adolescent. Remember, this is the crucial time of change. This is the crucial time for teaching the adolescent how to prepare for life in the real world. So the adolescent is casting around for their own story, casting around for their answer to the questions that keep them awake at night, you see? And, and where are they going to grab onto those answers? To their family of origin? Well, maybe, if their parents are helping them with those answers. Maybe from the society around them. Maybe from other Christian young people. Maybe they'll come to you as a pastoral counsellor looking for that story, looking for that basis, looking for that grounding, looking for that direction. So here's a, uh, you know, a 16-year-old boy comes to you and he's, he's, uh, he has this uh, uh, overriding habit of watching pornography as a 16-year-old. Well, what's going on there? Well, part of what's going on there is he's trying to grapple with the, 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 the sexually soaked culture that he's growing up in. And he's trying to come to terms with that. And he's trying to figure out how he should deal with that. And he's trying to figure out what his story is regarding sex and sexual relationships and what his position ought to be. And he, he, is, he knows so little, and yet he's expected to know so much. And where's he going to go to get that knowledge and that understanding? He, well, he's going to all the wrong places. They have no meaningful purpose or responsibility. Remember, meaningful purpose and responsibility are adult traits, which the adolescent um, may or may not have. Um, just give you a couple of examples of adolescent crisis and transition. And Genesis 37. Genesis 37, verse 1. 
Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. He's 17. He's 17, and he's bringing a bad report to dad about his older brothers. What's he doing? He's telling tales on his older brothers. And his older brother's obviously not going to be very excited about that. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he'd been born to him in his old age and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw all that their father when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So here's Joseph at 17, he's an adolescent, and he's growing up in a home where there is sibling hatred and rivalry and favoritism from the father and uh, tale-telling. Uh, tale Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the fields, when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to him. Now, we know, because we know the whole story, this was God at work, you see, and the day would come and this is exactly the thing that would happen. But for Joseph at 17, he has no story of his own. At 17, with all these older brothers who bully him and hate him and look for every opportunity to give him a hard time, he has no story of his own. He has no life experience on which he can stand on and face his brothers, except a dream. He has a dream in which he's top dog. And he likes that dream. Because as an adolescent in that family, it's all he's got. So he's going to make sure everyone knows about it. His brothers and his father. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he'd said. Then he had another dream. Well, why wouldn't he? It's all he's got. And he told his brothers, Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. The whole of creation was worshipping me. Doesn't that sound like a 17-year-old? Whole of life revolves around me and my angst. Whole of creation was bowing down to me. And, and when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him. His father figured he'd gone too far this time. What is this dream you had? Will your mother and your brothers actually come and bow down the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the matter in mind. A teenager who lives out of his dreams as the only story that he has. Now here's the adolescent dreaming about what life will be like as an adult. Here's the adolescent male dreaming about what it would be like uh, adult life as a confident man in his world. Here's an adolescent girl dreaming about adult life in terms of, of, of the things that she desires most to have in completing the tasks of adulthood. You see, for the adolescent, the dreams is all they've got. They've got no life story or life experience. They don't want their parents' dreams. They want their own dreams. And so they dream dreams. And they tell us about their dreams. Now, perhaps they don't tell us the way Joseph told his family, but they might say things like, what I really want, or what I really don't want, or I'm sick of this family, or I hate the way you always tell me what to do. You see, this is the child giving expression to his dreams, to her dreams. There's something going on in their heart that says, this is not working for me. This is not right. And the parents are saying, what do you mean it's not working for? This is a wonderful family. You've had a charmed upbringing. Well, charmed from whose point of view, you see? That's all they've got. We have to listen to their dreams, just like Joseph did, uh, Jacob did. His father kept the matter in mind. See, he, he thought about that dream of his 17-year-old son's. What about Luke 15? Oh, what a godly man, knows his Bible. Luke 15. A teenager leaves home to write his own story. Uh, <clears throat> there was a man who had two sons, verse 12. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Um, 30. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, you see, 
he was here in his family of origin and he wanted to be somewhere else, anywhere else but where dad was. A distant country, the further away he could go the better he liked it. So he took his father's money and off he went, you see, and it said he squandered his wealth on wild living. Now what does that tell you? That tells you that here's a boy trying to be an adult in an adult world and not even a clue how to do it. No sense of responsibility, no sense of the future, he's just acting out his adolescence in an adult environment uh, separated from his family of origin. He is, uh, <clears throat> he's leaving home to write his own story and he's doing a rotten job of it. Now by God's grace he comes back to his family of origin and he finds he has a good father, a godly father who is able to restore to him uh, some of, the, of what he lost in the crisis of the transition. Uh, here's the story of another teenager, Luke chapter 2, verse 50. Uh, let's go back to verse um, 48. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Now we know from verse 42 that he's 12 years old. That puts him right here, early adolescence. 49, why were you searching for me, he asked. Did you, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? 50, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Surprise, surprise, here's a teenager whose parents do not understand them. Well, every teenager in the world has probably at some point figured their parents do not understand them. And here's, here's the Lord at 12 years of age, an adolescent. 51, then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. Now here's a, here's a classic example of what a godly teenager does. A godly teenager acknowledges the truth. My parents don't seem to understand me, yet I will be obedient to them. I will be obedient to them, verse 51, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now, now you see the implication very strongly as if, as if that he rebelled against that, his parents, verse 51, was not obedient to them, then he wouldn't have grown in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus, as a teenager, was content to let God write his story while he grew up intellectually, physically, socially, and spiritually. In other words, he trusted God for God to write his story for him so that when he got to adulthood, he would be ready to launch out into God's story for him rather than feeling he had to thrash around to find his own story. He was content to wait and to trust God and to obey his parents and to obey God until that time came. The reasons for adolescent angst uh, many and varied, but children who grow up in a stable home with a faith in God are more likely to come through these crisis years without long-lasting self-harm. While they may well encounter a rocky road through adolescence, most do come through into mature adulthood. I had a father who came to me very concerned about his teenage son who was about in the 16, 17-year-old category. And, uh, and uh, the father was a... Um, was a businessman, and um, in the moment of foolish optimism, I said to the father, I made a little prediction, look, just you wait, by the time he's 30, he'll be a respectable businessman just like his father. See, and sure enough, <laughs> by God's grace, you see, it's exactly what happened. You see, they, they, most of them do come through it into mature adulthood. It's always too soon to panic about our adolescence. That's not on here, but you can write that down if you want to. It's always too soon to panic about our adolescence. Okay, let's take a break. Let's look at what the stage theorists have to say about the adolescent lifespan. Ah, there's no avoiding the stage age theorists. Let's look at Freud first. Uh, psychosexual. Now, if you've got your this one here, this handout, for stage age theorists. Uh, Freud, 13 to 23. That just about covers it all, doesn't it? 13 to 23. Well, since Freud's time, it's now 10 to 25 because of all the estrogen in the food chain. And for him, this was the genital phase. So we've gone from the latency phase back in here to the genital phase, 
uh, in keeping with Freud's interest in sexual development and behaviour, he saw this stage as the final stage of psychosexual development reached in pu puberty when a mature pattern of sexual traits are developed, including erotic interest and activity focused on a, for Freud, heterosexual partner. Freud saw homosexuality as being abnormal and as being a counselling issue. Well, uh, life in the Western world has overtaken Freud. Hence, I've put the hetero in, in uh, brackets there. Um, now we consider mature sexual behaviour can be actively focused on a partner of either gender. For Freud, uh, this genital phase represents the unification and maturation of all erotic functions. Well, he was loading an awful lot into the adolescent phase in terms of his understanding of sexual maturity. You see, for Freud, nothing happens after 23. See on that chart? Nothing happens after 23. In other words, this is it. In terms of sexual development, uh, begins here with uh, potty training, nothing happens in here, and bang, it all happens here at once. Now, based on his observations, he saw what happened in adolescence, uh, sexually and biologically, and uh, so it led him to, to conclude that all the development happens here, and once you get into adulthood, there's no more sexual development. So he loaded everything into here. Um, now, you know, given the uh, the the um, uh, the id and uh, the seeking for expression, you know, the basic instincts and the repression that comes from society and family and so on, and the tension that it raises. Remember our little triangle diagram on Freud. You see now, for Freud, that came to the that came to fullest expression in adolescence, where the adolescence uh, sexual instincts were in full full drive. And the pressures of society or family or church or whatever, religion, was pressing down on that, seeking to conform it and to suppress it. And for Freud, he's saying that's where the angst comes from in adolescence. What we need to do is remove those controls in order to give full expression to the teenager's growing, explosive sexual instincts and sexual drive in order to produce sexually happy and well-adjusted adults. Now, now Western society has, yeah, has bought into that lock, stock and barrel and so what we see in New Zealand today is exactly the outworking of Freud's conclusions about psychosexual development in adolescence. Where uh, adolescent children, are, adolescents, are encouraged to be sexually promiscuous with either gender. Freud's focus was somewhat limited and took no account of the immaturity of the individual. You see Freud used words like um, a mature pattern of sexual traits are developed. It represents the unification and maturation of all erotic functions. In other words, he assumed that this was the, this because there's nothing coming, there's nothing further in his here, he assumed that here is where sexual maturity is reached. And that sexual maturity has been held back by the repressive restrictions of society remove those restrictions and the adolescent will move into early adulthood a sexually mature individual. Now what he didn't take account of was that uh, the adolescent is immature in terms of cognitive development, he's immature and she is immature in terms of life experience, immature in terms of moral development, immature in terms of social development. Remember all Freud saw was sexual development. For him everything was sexual. All those other things were subservient to the sexual. And he said, get the sexual right and everything else will happen. That's the most powerful drive. Well, he took no account of the immaturity of the individual. Genital maturity does not equate to the wisdom necessary to know what to do with a body that can now function sexually. We are not free to do with our bodies as we please. Erickson, uh, psychosocial. Looking on your chart here, um, Erickson named this stage identity versus role confusion, 13 to 23. Um, and again, remember with Erickson, in each of those boxes, if one doesn't happen, the other will. 
if there's basic trust in uh, conception and inter um, and conception and infancy, if there's autonomy and initiative in uh, and and in industry in the childhood years, then there will be identity. There will be identity in adolescence. Do I have what it takes to be a man in an unsafe world? Do I have what it takes to uh, to be able to find the man that will uh, be the man for me? I'm not sure how girls express that, so I'm struggling for words here. But you see, uh, you see, and 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 Erickson would say that at identity at this stage basically means that those questions are answered in adolescence before they move into adulthood. Role confusion is where those questions are not answered for whatever reason and so the adolescent moves into adulthood with confusion for the man. Where do I, where do I look in order to establish my manhood, prove my manhood, develop my manhood to be a man? Do I do it in my work? Do I do it in sport? Do I do it in pleasure? Do I do it in marriage relationship? Do I do it with having children? You see the options are endless. It's, that is raw confusion for Ericsson. Uh, <clears throat> this is what Ericsson said, among other things. Faced with the physiological revolution within them, that's the body, change of the body, and with tangible adult tasks ahead of them, looming up, looming up, there's no avoiding it. It's coming like a train crash. Adolescents are now primarily concerned with how they appear in the eyes of others. Physiological revolution. How do I appear in the eyes of others? When others see me, do they see what I see? A body that's, that's, that's not working properly, that's doing all kinds of crazy things, and, uh, and with tangible adult tasks ahead of them, do people view me as someone who's got what it takes to perform those adult tasks that are coming up ahead of me, right in front of me? You see? It's, and, and if uh, uh, the raw confusion the raw confusion comes when the adolescent finds that that the the answer to those questions are beyond them and hence a crisis develops uh, for Ericsson they have been called on to establish a new identity for themselves as they approach the adult world you know hence they do crazy things with their hair they do crazy things with the clothes they wear they act out in crazy in a crazy way uh, they're they're searching for a new identity for themselves they know they can't go into adulthood as mummy's little boy or daddy's little girl they can't that's not going to do them for adulthood it might do them back here but they have to have a new identity an adult like an adult looking identity they have to my kids used to say to me dad we just fake it till we make it do that. We just fake it till we make it. That's how they dealt with the transition into adulthood. I don't know quite what to say about that. Well, they're, they're, I guess they're, 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 they're trying. You see, they're trying to find their identity, their new identity, and they're not sure that they're going to be able to pull it off. So they're going to, you see, as Erickson said, they're concerned with how they appear in the eyes of others, so we're just going to fake it until we make it. In other words, we want people to think that we're doing okay with this transition. Uh, do they have what it takes to be all that the adult world expects of them? Where will they look for the answers to this question? If they reach adulthood, which is unavoidable, I guess there's no if, without this question being answered in the affirmative, how will it affect them as adults? Who am I? What am I good at? How can I be liked and valued? What is the purpose of my life? They experiment with identity and dress. It's not about shame-based parents. They experience oscillating feelings between independence and dependence. It's a time of crisis. Boys faced with two views of masculinity, to be tough or tender. A post-feminine culture produces no clear answers. A time of confusion for both genders. The experiment with identity and, and dress, and the parents freak out. You're not going to go to church dressed like that, are you? Now, <clears throat> it, may be that, it may be that they're not dressing immodestly. It may be they're just going with jeans with big holes in the knees. You're not going to church dressed like that, are you? What are you doing with your hair? You can't let people see you like that with that. What's that purple streak going through your hair? You're not going to go outside and let people see you, are you? 
You see, this is shame-based parents. Shame-based parents putting impediments in the way of the child's immature efforts at establishing their own identity as separate from their family of origin. And as the parents put impediments to that immature search for a new identity, what's the parent saying to the child? The identity that we have given you in childhood is all you need for adulthood. Now, that just shows the parent has no understanding of adolescence. Or they've forgotten their own adolescence. The identity of childhood does not prepare one for adulthood. This is a time of transition where we go from being a child to being an adult. And in that, the adolescent has to find the identity they want to go into adulthood with. So the boy spends hours in his room, you know, lifting weights. You see, he wants to go in adulthood, into adulthood as a, as a hunk. You see, as, because that's how he'll get through. That's how people will make way for him. That's how he'll get ahead. That's what he tells himself in his immature search for identity. Maybe his father should pay for his gym membership. Stand with him rather than try to control him or change him. Um, the the uh, you know I, I've suggested here that you know building on this idea of a, of an adult male, uh, sorry, uh, um, an adolescent male asking himself, "Do I have what it takes to be a man in an unsafe world?" He's asking himself, well, "What does manhood look like? Does it look like the?" Um, the tough macho jerk that I see walking around the streets, or does it look like that um, the sissy, the sissy guys that I see on um, Modern Family? You ever seen Modern Family? There's a macho jerk husband. There's a sissy husband, and there's a couple of homosexual guys, and this is the Modern Family, and and nowhere in there is a man as the Bible portrays a man. And so the adolescent male looks at all that and he says, how does my culture view manhood? And, and so he's, he's then moves between, well, do I have to be gay? Do I have to be a bully? Do I have to be uh, a sissy? Where do I go? It's a time of confusion. Okay, that's uh, psychosocial. Uh, Piaget, cognitive. Now, for Piaget, notice 13 to 23 is the formal age of education. Uh, and uh, again, for Piaget, it doesn't go beyond that. Now, we, we know now, for instance, that adult education is a huge part of our society, and there's, uh, you know, there's a huge move into adult education, as well as uh, preschool education, both ends. Uh, Piaget tended to discount both of those ends. And so... Uh, but anyway, for Piaget, the adolescent years was the final stage of cognitive development. Uh, now, Piaget was saying, you know, that if you miss out on your cognitive development through here, this is your last chance because you'll go into adulthood with the cognitive development you've got up until 25, and then there'll be no more cognitive development. Well, I see people in here all the time over 25 doing classes at GTC. We're committed to adult education. And, you know, as church, as Christians, we're committed to adult education. When the Bible makes an end of teaching, then we will make an end of learning. And right through to old, old age, we can still learn and be educated in the things of Christ. But however, for Piaget, this was the final stage of cognitive development, the formal operation operational stage. This stage is characterized by the ability to entertain contrary to the fact propositions, in other words, abstract theories. Um, to learn about physics, for instance, which is a contrary to the fact propositions. I mean, you don't see, uh, you don't see the f theories of physics or theories of chemistry in day-to-day -day living. Um, you see, remember before this is the concrete stage, 7 to 11, where it had to be very concrete, very hands-on, very visible, very uh, able to be handled. Now in the formal stage, this is formal education, where we can learn abstract theories, construct ideals, grasp possibilities and probabilities, as well as higher order abstractions. Once an individual reaches this stage, then the rest of his or her life is spent in developing this formal reasoning or building upon it. 
Hence, you see, Piaget's theories have, have given impetus to this huge development, of, particularly in the Western world, of tertiary education, that no longer do children leave school at 16 and 17 and go into the workforce. Because of Piaget's theories, Piaget is saying, look, hold on, this is the last chance to prepare them cognitively for the rest of their lives. So don't be too quick to put them into the workforce. You see, let's provide tertiary education for them. And so, you know, for many years, the government would pay university and tertiary fees because of this commitment that a well-educated adolescent will provide for well-educated and adjusted adult in the workforce economic unit. Does he actually put a number on it, like 25? Uh, well, he has 23. 23. Yeah, and uh, Berger might have something to say about that. Um, so, uh, the, the, um, you see how these theories have influenced our thinking so much in our society. Now, now as Christians, we want to say, well, no. <laughs> you know, people continue to learn and be educated in the things of Christ forever. Now, uh, that means not only in the things of Christ. You see, the mind... Um, uh, Contently, the mind continues to grow and to develop till uh, about 60 when it goes over here. 60, somewhere in here, <laughs> depending on your perspective. You see, at 60, cognitively, the brain begins to slow down, is not able to learn things as much. Now, all that is comes as a result of brain research, and, which has happened long after Piaget's day, you see. In other words, thanks to that understanding of how the brain works, we're able to push Piaget's theories out and say, well, no, in fact, right up to here, the brain is able to absorb new things. And so, um, uh, you know, you, occasionally you read about, you know, grandma who graduates from university with a degree, and there's a picture on the front page of the Courier, and it's a big deal. Well, it is a big deal because Piaget would say it can't happen. <laughs> That's why it's a big deal. But we would say, well, what's the big deal about that? God created us to be learning about his world for the whole of our lives. And we should rejoice in opportunities to do that. Now remember Piaget's um, <laughs> Piaget's theories weren't based were only based on observation, and he didn't observe in his day a lot of um, cognitive development among adults. Now, you can understand why. Look how hard it is to get people to study at GTC who are married with children. See, it's like pulling teeth. Because, you see, once you get into the adult stage, you, you, your life is taken up with other things. Cognitive development suddenly slips all the way down on the scale. And, uh, you know, ideally, this is when they should be coming to study at GTC or any tertiary institution. But, you know, their, their lives are just so busy establishing their new identity that it's not until they get into here they begin to take stock and slow down and say, hmm, yeah, I wonder if there's some other things I'd really like to be doing before I settle down to a lifetime of middle age and old age. I mean, are there some other things I'd like to learn and do and develop and prepare myself for in the body of Christ? You see, it's, it's, it's unlimited training for unlimited service and unlimited number of variety of ways to Christ's glory and honour. See, it never needs to stop. It never needs to stop. So... Uh, uh, so people in adulthood keep going back to university and go mad by degrees, get more and more of them. In practice, children can display many traits of formal reasoning and abstract thinking before the age of puberty. They can study about God and theology and know and believe the reality of the unseen world. Uh, that's just basically to make a comment that formal formal learning doesn't begin with adolescence. Formal learning can begin back here, which we talked about, I think, last time, uh, and what's not on the notes, but also the point that, in fact, not only can we push Piaget back here with formal learning, but we can also push formal learning forward. Okay, uh, Kohlberg, moral development. Now, you've, you have access to this one. Uh, Piaget, uh, Kohlberg is um, stage four, social order, but you really need to have this little diagram so you can see it all laid out in perpetual motion. So uh, looking at the age then, 13 to 23, which is just about captures the uh, early, middle and late stages of adolescence, 13 to 23, uh, 
this was in the level of conventional morality, this was social order. Remember, 6 to 12 was interpersonal concordance, where there's the desire to please, and the 6 to 12 year old, that's the uh, um, middle childhood, or late childhood, see how the terms change, this used to be called late childhood, it's now called adolescence, it's stuck with middle childhood. Middle childhood is keen to please, the 6 to 12 year old is very pleased, uh, very keen to please, they will do his duties and do what they're told. That's interpersonal concordance, they want concordance in the home um, and um, between the family members. But for the adolescent, for Kohlberg's moral development, it was a social order. This is the second stage of Kohlberg's level 2 conventional morality, sometimes just known as stage 4. Uh, Kohlberg called them stage 1 and 2, level 1, stage 1 and 2, level 2, stage 1 and 2, level 3. You see the bottom of your page. Other people have come along later and in order to simplify the classification, the notation, have just called it stages 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So depending on which classification you're using, this is either stage 4 or it's stage 2 of level 2. Uh, social order. This level is characterized by identification with and conformity to the moral rules of family and society. So that's, that's conventional morality. This level two, conventional morality, is characterized by conformity to the moral rules of family and society. Uh, you see, in pre-conventional morality, there's no understanding of the moral rules of uh, family and society. In pre-conventional morality, you're still learning what those rules are through punishment or, or, uh, or you know, carrot or stick, punishment or hedonistic, you see that? When you get to level two, conventional morality, you have learnt the moral codes of the society, church or home that you're living in and you are abiding by them to greater or lesser extent. Now for Kohlberg, conventional morality was as far as most people get. Very few people get to level three. Most people are content at level two to stay with, uh, within the bounds of a morality that's been set for them by others. Level three, post-conventional morality, is for those who, who those few extra special people who develop um, uh, a moral framework and context of their own in which to live. Uh, a moral framework that's not dependent on the rules or desires of others. Uh, but anyway, coming back to social order for the 13 to 23 year olds. Um, so in the adolescent stage of social order, the young person is seeking to adjust to the social and moral norms of adult living. But now here's the thing. Those morals and norms of adult living may not be the morals and norms of the family of origin. But they may be the morals and norms for the adult world in which they see themselves about to launch into. So they may be going through a transition here where they are beginning to change their moral code from their family of origin to a code which they believe will help them better to survive in the adult world. So a teenager who's grown up in a home, for instance, where there's no alcohol, may, may find himself drinking, particularly 17 to 25. Why? Because he's, he sees in the adult world that people drink and he feels, well, I need to, you know, so he changes his moral code on that. I need to be drinking in order to fit in in order to see conventional morality. How do I fit in with the conventions of the morals of the society in which I'm about to move into? You see, it may not be rebellion at all. The reason he's drinking alcohol or staying out late, it may not be rebellion at all. It just may be his struggle to try to adjust his moral compass, this is his immaturity talking, to adjust his moral compass to survive in an adult world which he feels that the moral compass of his family of origin does not equip him for. Well, he doesn't. He wants to feel secure, so he's going to feel insecure if he's different. Yes. And this is security in Christ. Right. So for Kohlberg, conventional morality, the adolescent is fitting into the social order of the day and it may be different from the social order of his family of origin. That's really the point from our point of view. They are looking for the organizing principle that permits the group to operate as a harmonious whole. So for instance, this, uh, <coughs> they move into the workforce for instance, say their first job outside of tertiary education and they go into the office and 
you know, they're just, they're not doing anything, not giving a lot of responsibility, but they're there. And what are they doing? They're immediately casting around to figure out what's the organizing principle here? How do people relate to one another? On what basis do they relate? And so he goes up to the water cooler and he sees some guys standing around the water cooler and they're telling dirty jokes and laughing. And he, he, he come from a Christian home and he's figuring out pretty quickly, oh, this is the organizing principle among the guys here. You see, this is how they operate. And so he's, he's casting around for the, the moral principles that permit the group to operate as a harmonious whole. And he knows <coughs> that if he stands at the water cooler and he says something like, uh, well, that's not a very nice thing to say. That's not the way I was raised. You see, that's not going to contribute to the harmonious whole of office life. That's going to create disharmony, especially for him. And he'll be pushed out of the group. The larger and more diverse the population, the more complex the social order. Many layers of regulations exist with violations often leading to conflicts with those who obey the regulations. It probably should be disobey. Who disobey the regulations. As the adolescent matures, they will in most cases establish their own social order, often different from the one they were raised with. Now for Kohlberg, that is um, mature moral development. To be able to establish eventually their own social order. It was Kohlberg's view that very few people advance in their moral development beyond his level two. This is where most elect to stay. Having come through the stormy waters of the moral angst of adolescence, we are quite prepared to remain morally where others would have us. And so you, you take on the moral norm, say, of the office in order to be able to harmoniously stay in that job and perhaps progress in that job. Um, where others would have us, that's where we sit. We, we want to avoid any further angst that we have in adulthood. Perhaps all the angst in adulthood was with the family of origin as you readjusted your own moral code and compass and now that you're in an office where you can adjust to their moral code and compass rather than experiencing angst you're experiencing settlement and calm and peace and you say to yourself I've pulled it off. I've done it. I've figured out how to live in an unsafe world. And so Kohlberg says you just sit there with the conventional morality of the social order. Now, now, so you go to church on Sunday and you hear a different social order being proclaimed from the pulpit. Now, what's that going to do for you? Well, as the years go by, it may be that you'll, you'll, you'll hear it more as theoretical. Well, those are nice ideas. However, in practice, in reality, I've got to fit in with the boys, I've got to fit in with the girls. Otherwise, life will become unbearable for me and I won't be able to survive. I might even lose my job or whatever, I'll lose my friends. You see, and so there's a disconnect between the social order that you have accepted coming out of adolescence and the social order you hear preached on Sundays and you read about in the Bible. And, and the, our churches are full of people who live with that disconnect. And, and you preach your heart out and it seems to have no effect on the people who sit there because they have already reached their social order of conventional morality and they're going to stay there because they don't want any more angst, they don't want any more disruption. What does this have to say to the church's standard of morality? In our walk with God and in our growth and wisdom, what opportunities do we give each other to challenge the moral status quo laid down by the traditions and regulations of men? Now, I'm not talking about biblical morality here. I'm talking about the um, traditions and regulations of men. Um, I, was, uh, I was the youngest of four boys, and my oldest brother was not allowed to wear jeans on Sunday. Now, by the time I got to be a teenager, I was allowed to wear jeans on Sunday. Now, my oldest brother thought it was very unfair and bullied me mercilessly. Uh, but you, you see, the, the experience of raising four teenage boys began to cause my parents to question their code of morality and to ask themselves the deep questions. What's really important here? Uh, so, in other words, they gave themselves the permission, the opportunity to challenge the moral status quo as laid down by their traditions and regulations. And they were prepared to change them. You see? And uh, now, it may be on a larger scale in the church that we need to do that too. As we, we grow up believing that many of the moral codes that we've adopted are in fact biblical, where in fact they may not be if we take a second look. 
And, and often our adolescents will challenge us to take that second look and our resistance to take that second look will perhaps alienate the adolescent from the church culture that, that their parents belong to. But a willingness to talk to the adolescent, to take that second look, maybe the second look will result in changing our moral code or maybe it will result in the adolescent understanding the moral code, but whatever it is, it's a conversation we're willing to have because we're going to maintain a non-anxious presence with our adolescent as he challenges our own moral norms. We're going to maintain a non-anxious presence. We're going to enter into that conversation with them and trust God for the outcome and see where it goes. And if at the outcome the adolescent still takes a different moral stance from us, at least he will know and we will know that it's something that we can have a conversation about. So at some time in the future, the conversation may well be able to resume. Where have we as adults conformed to the moral expectations of others which adolescents in our lives see and disdain because they have not yet learnt to conform? What does moral maturity look like? The stronger brother giving ground and love to the weaker brother, and the stronger brother there is the Christian parent giving ground and love to the weaker brother, the their adolescent child. Now, you, you hear what I'm saying? I'm not saying we give ground on, on God's standard for morality. It's a willingness to look at what we have put in place, which is extra biblical. Or maybe we have put in place our application to biblical command, and we've made our application normative and universal and a requirement for others. And our adolescent may look at our application of biblical command and they may decide, well look, for me, I'm going to obey that biblical command this way. And so it becomes a matter of my application and your application look different, but we're both committed to the same command and to the same God and to the same Christ. For instance, um, here's a Christian man who mows his lawns on Sunday. And here's a Christian man who thinks it's wrong to mow your lawns on Sunday. The man who mows his lawns on Sunday is a man who spends all day in his office and he just loves getting out there in the fresh air and getting his hands dirty and grabbing that lawn mower, all the kinetic, you know, the feel of it, I'm punching a keyboard all week just to feel that lawn mower and to get out there. And for him, this is, his, this is the best way he can have a rest on Sunday. And, and perhaps the other guy is the one who mows lawns for a living during the week. See, so to mow lawns on Sunday is not to rest from his labour. You see, it's a different applications. Well, do we give each other space for different applications of biblical command? Do we give our adolescent space to come up with different uh, applications to biblical command? You see, the Christian life is not moralistic. It's not a moralistic life determined by other people. You see, uh, Kohlberg's social order, uh, as he set up there, was to adjust to the social and moral norms of adult living, looking for the organising principle um, uh, <coughs> from what other people have to say. Now, the Christian life is not moralistic in that sense. In other words, we don't live our life based on what other people say or expect that we ought to do. Rather, it's a life that invites others in love to experience the life of Christ through repentance and forgiveness. The Christian life is not a life of morals, it's a life of repentance and forgiveness. And out of that repentance and forgiveness, there's the desire to live a life that reflects the life of Christ, to bear the fruit of the Spirit, to be conformed into him, His image. You see, that's not a moralistic life, that's a life based on relationship. From this dynamic will flow a life that conforms to the likeness of Jesus Christ, thus transcending any man-made morality. Now, I just wanted to hand this out to you. This, um, this actually, I should have handed this out when we were talking about uh, Freud and psychosexual. This is the high cost of sexualizing our youth, which, of course, we are doing at breakneck speed. Okay, well, there's been a lot of material there tonight, and I apologise for the speed of delivery, uh, but um, we've got a few minutes here if you'd like to respond with anything that we've said this evening. Ask a question for clarification, or share an experience of adolescence that you remember, with either joy or angst.